Well, I'd like to start with this little cartoon. Uh, we're at the breakfast table, and Mom says to Dad, Hillary's spelling test is today, Ted. Can you give her one last run-through? And he says, sure. Ready? Erosion. That's not the first word, Dad. How can I spell them if you jumble them up? <laughs> you only know them in order? I don't know them. I memorize them. Nobody said anything about knowing them. So we've got to be honest with ourselves. For a long time, we've rewarded the good memorizers. Kids who could memorize it quickly, give it back to us right away, exactly the way we gave it to them, we'd say, good job, they got the good grades, right? They were the kids who thought they were the smartest in the room. But when you're teaching, you know that as you start to probe a little bit, they really don't understand it because they didn't do anything more than memorize it. So in my years of teaching, which is when I started to get interested in this, I found that the most interesting lessons were when we did something other than memorize, when we got involved in it. And over the years, this has evolved to be called cognitive rigor or depth of knowledge or some of those things. But I think all of us who've been in the classroom know that when you have an engaging learning activity, you are thinking at deeper levels. So that's part of why I this is important to me, and I hope important to you. Also, I have this little graphic here um, that comes from a paper put out by Marzano and Toth back in March 2014. And the graphic caught my eye because it was talking about rigor and instructional rigor. And they looked at millions of data points from classroom lesson observations. And here's the thing I want you to just notice. 58% of all the lessons that they reviewed were introducing new content. 36% of all the lessons they reviewed were practicing the new content. That doesn't leave much time for complex tasks. Now, I'm sure part of that has to do with new standards and changes in curriculum. But if you're going to spend all but 6% of your time just giving kids new information, they're never going to make the connections and be able to do the complex tasks. So we have to find a way to prioritize what's most important in the new content so that they can start to work with it. So hopefully by the end of the morning, you'll feel like you've gotten some good strategies for doing that. Because as Madeline Hunter once said many years ago, if you know uh, the name Madeline Hunter, she said, if you're just going to worry about covering the curriculum, you should just dig a hole and bury it. Huh. Because the teacher is the only one that's really covering it. Let's face it, um, kids need time to integrate that information. So that's what we're about today and, and hopefully for years to come. So I'd like to uh, also ask you, I will stop you at some point, and I will ask you to Think about ways you're refining your understanding of depth of knowledge and rigor. But I also want you to think about what strategic scaffolding strategies are also coming to mind. Because you can't think about increasing the rigor without getting kids there. Scaffolding to me is like rungs on the ladder. I want all kids to get to the top of that ladder. And some of them may need more rungs but they all need to be able to be successful with the complex work. They will not be college and career ready otherwise. And to, to just define what I mean by scaffolding and how I distinguish it from differentiation. Scaffolding is getting all the kids prepared to be successful with the same task. Differentiation can mean different tasks. They are doing different maybe complementary tasks. And I'll talk about that near the end of the morning. But when I talk about scaffolding, I'm saying, how are we going to get everybody there? How is every going to be, everybody going to be successful? So before we begin, I'd like you to take uh, two to three minutes uh, to jot down a couple of words or phrases that come to mind when you think of cognitive rigor as it relates to teaching, instruction, learning, or assessment. What immediately comes to mind? what I'd like you to do now is share at your tables and look for, listen for, what's the same on all of your lists and what's different. Let's hear some of the things uh, that people agreed with at your table. 
If you would, if uh, when I ask you, I'm going to give you a mic just so you know everybody can hear in the room. Um, so let's start with this table right here. Something you all agreed on. Who who wants to be the spokesperson? Thank you. Um, so all of us agreed that um, to have cognitive rigor and anything that we ask the students to do, it's going to definitely take a lot of time, not only on uh, teacher prep to get them there, or, but also uh, student involvement. Okay, time is almost the, always one of the first things that comes up on the list because you know to do anything well, you have to allow the time, and that's when people get stressed out because they say, but I have so much to cover, right? How about something from this table? You willing to share? Thank you. Yeah, we, were, we all agreed that um, we need to be able to transfer that information, cross-curricular transfer, so they're not just using that in one subject, they're using it in others and they're taking it deeper. Great. Transfer almost always comes up in these discussions. And I like to use the metaphor that I heard many, many years ago Grant Wiggins shared in a workshop. He said, coming to school is like being on the team. You get to come to practice every day and do the drills, but you don't get to play very many games. When you play the game, that's transfer. That's when you figure out when to dribble, when to pass, when to shoot, when is it going to work in a game situation. You're making decisions on your feet. As a matter of fact, he tells a very funny, he used to tell a very funny story about coaching his daughter's soccer team when she was in middle school. And he said he's standing on the sidelines and they're not doing anything that they did in practice. And he's yelling to one of the players, he says, Stephanie, look for the open man, give and go like we did in practice. And she turns around and puts her hands on her hips and says, they're not lining up like they did in practice. Right? Sometimes we're not giving them opportunities to transfer before they get to the game at the end. So in between the, pre the drills and the game are the scrimmages, right? How's a scrimmage different from a game? How's a scrimmage different? There's coaching interaction. You can stop and say, what just happened here? Let's look at where everybody is. What could we do next? You think, you just sort of do a think aloud in the moment. How else is a scrimmage different? It might be scripted. You have a certain plan, something you want to accomplish. You were going to say something as well? They're playing against their own players. They're, They're playing against their own better. players. Okay, mm -hmm. it's not a real game. It doesn't count. There's no score. It's formative assessment, right? The best kind of formative assessment is when you start to put the skills together and practice it. So I like to challenge teachers to look at a unit plan and say, where are my drills? Where are my games? And where are the scrimmages? Because if you don't have any scrimmages, they're not ready for the game. Often the scrimmages have a lot of scaffolding to prepare them for the game. So we'll kind of continue to come back to that idea of what kind of scaffolding helps kids to practice integrating those skills. How about another example? How about from this table? Something you all agreed on? She's saying, do I have to take the mic? <laughs> uh, we talked about how there, there needs to be proof in their logic and engagement. Um, Asking why. Okay, say a little bit more about proof. What did you mean by that? Well, I can. You can. Well, you have I a whole table here, so they can help you. We want to add to that. I, I would say, um, proof in their logic is just being able to use some examples and use different resources to come together with their ideas, how they came up with those ideas, and showing, um, showing some evidence of their thinking. Okay, so evidence of thinking changes by content area, right? If it's a math problem, the evidence becomes the calculations, the diagrams, the graphs, the tables, the equations, the explanations, the words that go with it. That's very different evidence from when they're doing reading or maybe when they're doing science, when they're looking at their measurements becomes their evidence. So we have to teach kids that in each content area where to find the evidence. 
And if we ask good questions, we're pointing them in the right direction, but sometimes we don't help them so much. We just ask a big, wide open question, and then they're a little confused. Good. And you said engagement. How many people had engagement? I assume that probably came up at many tables. Engagement. Um, how about, I'm going to squeeze back here. How about this table here? Something else you might have had in common at your table. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. <laughs> um, we talked about giving them the, the wait time needed so that they feel that they have enough time to process the information and then be able to work together as groups um, like we're doing now, sharing with our shore partner so that they can learn from others as well as from themselves. Yeah, you said uh, quite a few, uh, several different things, so let me unpack it a little bit. You said working together. Here's what we know about the research with working together. You don't need to be a good cooperator to be successful in college, but you do need it to be successful in the workplace, in life. So it's a skill we want kids to develop over time. What's most important about the group work is you can learn more and you can learn more quickly when you learn together. So putting kids into groups to do low-level tasks is not really the idea behind this. It's putting them together and letting them struggle together and feel the sense of accomplishment of working together like a team. And that involves that engagement, that wait time, that processing time. Because let's be honest, teachers kind of like to jump in. They, we feel like we've got to save them sometimes. And maybe all they need is a hint to keep them moving. They don't need us to do all the thinking. When I say, who's working hardest in your classroom? Sometimes the teacher's doing all the thinking for them. But some, we have to be willing to step back and be more of a coach and let them do that struggle. Would you mind passing that over to this table next to you? Maybe share something from that table? Um, one idea that we had was working smarter, not harder. And really um, focusing our, our questioning and, and our research, whatever we're trying to build, in a shorter amount of time, that's making it go smarter. What would be an example of that? Can anybody at your table or any table, what would be an example of how you might work smarter but not harder? What comes to mind in an elementary classroom? Worksheets. 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 Say a little bit more about worksheets. Number of problems, doing the same thing. Okay, the number of problems. Guilty. When I started teaching, I came into a, a classroom and all that stuff was there waiting for me. So I used it. And then I thought, why do they have to do 30 of these problems? Maybe they could do fewer and do more with it. So that's what we're, we're trimming down. We're still finding out what they know, but maybe we, I'm going to show you some samples of some student work. And you'll see that these kindergarten kids are learning to count, but they're learning to do more with their counting skills from that. So I think we have to do those kinds of things. We have to decide when we can go deep and really access some of the other skills. Can we pass that all the way over to this table here? Thank you. I just don't want to <laughs> cause the interference with the microphone. Thank you. Well, we talked about incorporating more project-based learning, teaching to and above the standards, and we talked a little bit about assessments and maybe incorporating more open response assessments instead of multiple choice and true false. Here's what the research says about multiple choice questions, and open response questions. When kids are asked to construct their own answers, they remember the content better than when they learn how to select an answer. Because when they are selecting an answer, they're recalling something that looks familiar. But when they actually have to create it with words, with explanations, they're going to be more engaged with the content and remember it better. So even though we know there are going to be assessments where they have to learn to select an answer, we have to teach them to think about why they're selecting the answers they're selecting. Is there any table um, who has anything else that they didn't, hasn't been shared yet, but it would be good to be shared for the group? There's one thing um, that I didn't hear 
Um, and sometimes it comes up with the word relevance. It has to be relevant to kids. It often comes up when you're talking about engaging and is relevant to them. And this is a little piece I just want to mention about um, memory. We have short-term memory. We have mm -hmm. long-term memory. Short-term memory is you all introduce yourselves, and by the time I get to you, I don't remember your name, right? Short-term no, memory. Okay. We can only hold so many pieces of information that are not connected to anything else. And then we have to let something go when the new piece comes in. It's when you see it all the time in a classroom, when you get all done explaining to kids what they're going to do, and then somebody says, do we put our names on the paper? <laughs> and they're asking like the only question they can think of because they haven't, they haven't processed all the pieces that we've given them. So without making any connections, it's not going to move to long-term memory. Two things are necessary to move information from short-term memory to long-term memory. It has to connect to something they already know, even if it challenges something they already know. So if they don't have anything to connect it to, it's just kind of floating out in the ethers. The second thing, there has to be personal relevance. They have to find a way to internalize it, to say it in their own words, to draw it, to act it out, to make meaning for themselves. There's one little activity that I've used for a very long time, and it works pretty well. It's called a one-pager. Now, first of all, it's called a one-pager, so it doesn't sound like it's a long assignment, right? It sounds like it would be easy enough for anybody to do. And it works really well when they've been asked to read something. So they're asked to copy one quote, one line from the text. That's the first part of the page. Well, that sounds pretty easy. I just have to find something there and copy it. In the middle of the page, they say why they chose that and how it connects to what the story is about, to what the article is about. And then at the bottom of the page, they draw a little visual. It could be a, an illustration. It could be um, a diagram something that has meaning for them. Now think about what that does. They had some choice, they picked the quote, they had to connect it to why they picked the quote, and then they have to really create some kind of a visual that represents it for them. And then imagine if you said, now go find somebody else and share what you selected. It's amazing how something that simple really hits connecting to what you already know, making it relevant. And once you have two or three students sharing what they have, you have a better discussion of that text than anything you probably could have facilitated and designed. Trust me on this. That's a really easy one to implement. Does it get to more rigor? Sure, because it's making connections, it's interpreting, it's maybe creating some symbolism for something.